that they can see that uh, we are accommodating that snowmobile trail that uh, that essentially starts, in fact, I think the one gentleman <coughs> said it starts in Pennsylvania somewhere, which, which does. I didn't realize that, and comes up, comes up through here and crosses the uh, land of the uh, Conservation Club, and then the two parcels owned by Mr. Baldo, and then it comes over here, and then it'll move straight. So we basically ha have a uh, agreement with them that said, hey, we will accommodate that. And, uh, and then the, the <coughs> parcel itself, probably, we, we haven't decided yet, but it's probably going to be what I would call down in western Pennsylvania, where I'm from, I was born and reared, that's probably going to be a, like a, uh, I, I refer to it as a horse fence. It's about an eight foot high fence, and essentially we'll, we want to keep the deer out. Uh, but I can tell you that down in Pennsylvania, I've, pro I've seen deer when I've been hunting uh, jump eight foot high fences, but obviously we don't want to put barbed wire on it or anything like that. But we think the eight foot fence, which is custom in, in various uh, projects and various farms, will be adequate in order to you know, keep, out, keep out the, uh, the deer. So we've got a, we've got a, a way to uh, satisfy the snowmobile builders so that it's not gonna, in, uh, it's not gonna interfere with them. And we have a setback situation where essentially the panels <coughs> will be back. And you can see uh, it's going to start here. And uh, here, is a, here is a home and here, here is a home uh, right there. And uh, we'll be up starting at uh, probably around 200, 250 feet in back of, uh, <coughs> of, the, of the two homes here that, that could, be, could be impacted, but we don't think they will be. Uh, in conclusion, the, the, uh, the project uh, will probably be coming online and we would look at some time between, uh, depending upon permitting, but we would have it online sometime between the 20, at the uh, end of the summer of uh, 2020 or the beginning sometime in 2021 is what the impact would be. I'm going to give you now. Uh, I guess I'll wait though. I'm going to wait for, to have uh, uh, DePauli uh, from E and E basically discuss very quickly the uh, the uh, process. permitting process, and then uh, we can open up for questions. Sure. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, as Lou said, my name is DePauli McClo from Ecology and Environment or formerly DePaulo Oberoi, as, as you heard. Um, but I've been with Ecology and Environment for 18 years. So um, Lou was very complimentary when he said he, he called on us because we have a lot of local experience, but a lot of experience throughout the US on doing environmental assessments, um, impact statements, and, and working through various regulatory processes. Um, I'm from Western New York. I, you know, haven't been out to this area too much, except that I, incidentally, and I'm not even sure Lou knows this, was working on the Western New York Regional Sustainability Plan, which <coughs> some of you may have heard because this county was involved in that some time ago. And so I facilitated those public meetings. And one of the things that I learned about this community and the other counties and communities that we were working with is that, that you know, that you value dialogue um, and two-way dialogue. And you want to know what's happening in your backyards, obviously, um, that a lot of a lot of the folks that are um, that have a lot at stake in these projects aren't trying to stop projects, but are just trying to understand better and have their questions answered, and hopefully be sitting at the table during some of the decision points. Um, so that is a as a project manager at E&E, I'm also very passionate about public involvement. That's what I specialize in. If, if I were to wear that hat, um, but. What I'm here today to do is first to listen to you um, and to, to better understand what your concerns might be and also to just provide some context on the regulatory process. So I know Lou mentioned the permitting and the regulatory process. Um, have any of you ever seen the wind projects that are somewhat local, you know, in western New York? And a uh, show of hands on how, how we feel about them. Yes, no? Yes? No. no. Okay. All right. Well, so full disclosure, I've worked on a number of wind projects over the last 18 years, but I've also just begun to work on solar, I've done other renewables, I've done um, PCB remediation projects. So all of them have, in my opinion, their, their pros and their cons. Um, but one of the beauties about solar is that it is so low impact in comparison to some of the other projects that, that you've seen or that you see might, might come online or that are, that are coming before you for, for input. Um, so the secret process, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is the State Environmental Quality Review Process. Um, it, it, 
actions are subject to seeker if there is, um, if the local agency, local or state agency is going to undertake, approve, or fund a project. So this process actually has a number of steps. More than what you see here, this is half of the steps in the process. But I cut it off because I wanted to show you that, that this process is a little bit more straightforward. I'm sorry, I'm going to stand no, in fine. front of you here. But it's a little more straightforward and a bit simpler than what you would have seen for maybe a wind project or another larger scale project. Um, are you familiar with the type one, type two, and unlisted actions of Seeker? So basically, it's a classification of what kind of project is being proposed. If you're putting a porch on your house, that's not going to be a major impact. If you're putting a wall bar in, there may be some impacts, but they're not going to be as great as maybe a wind farm. But over here, th there's basically certain criteria that you would need to be a certain type of action. So I don't want to get in the weeds on the actions, but I'll show you that this one is subject to seeker, but seeker doesn't necessarily mean a major environmental impact statement because there don't necessarily have to be major environmental impacts. So for this project, you see there are three different types of actions that we would think about evaluating. And this one falls under a type one action. And that usually means because there's a discretionary reason that the town is, there's a discretionary permit or decision that the town has to make. So this isn't really a DEC or Department of Environmental Conservation process or project, but there is going to be some sort of permit that the town has to approve, whether it's a building permit or a special use permit. They're looking at doing a solar ordinance. So that is a decision that your town board is going to have to make, and that is what is triggering this evaluation. The evaluation that, or analysis that takes place when you're looking at a type one action, which is one that won't have major impacts, is an environmental assessment form. It's not long, it's about 20 pages. So it, it, that will tell you right there that you're not anticipating uh, major, major impacts off the bat, but you do have to look and basically vet it to see what types of impacts there might be. Lou mentioned visual impacts. He mentioned the fact that there are some land impacts. There, you know, there could be wetland impacts depending on where you site a project, although none are anticipated here. Um, so a project has to, and by none anticipated, I mean that the developer is saying that they're going to try to avoid those, not that there are no wetlands present. Um, but a full environmental impact statement has to be done for this project. And then you get to this point, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit of, well, is it a major impact? Does, does the lead agency, which will likely be the town or the county, is it a major impact that they anticipate? Or is it not that major of an impact based on the analysis that was done? Sometimes that analysis is desktop. Sometimes it's field. You go, you take pictures, you do visual simulations. Sometimes <coughs> you walk the site to see where the wetlands are while it's still in the conceptual stages. So just following the green here, you see that we anticipate that this type one action, which again is one that is supposed to have minimal impacts, by looking at the desktop and looking at the site, which we also walked today or drove today, we anticipate getting a negative declaration in a perfect world, which is that there shouldn't be major impacts. And that's when the review process ends. So I guess the question I usually have when I meet with someone like Lou is, are we looking at an environmental impact statement? How many opportunities are there for the public to participate? Are they going to get to comment? Are they going to submit written comments? Are we going to hire all of these different experts to look at all the different various impacts that there could be? And the answer here is <coughs> likely not. Um, so I guess that's to provide you context. And that is also why I'm really excited to work with Lou on this sort of project, because the dialogue that we have is not actually a requirement of the seeker process, but it's something that that Lou and his organization are wanting to do to better understand the neighbor's concerns, the community's concerns, like the snowmobilers, and working with, with the residents in the area and the agencies in the area. So that was a lot, but um, we're open to questions and comments, of course. Um, one of the things that I forgot to mention, um, and John has been pointing out to me, is that as a town, because we don't have experience with this type of uh, project, we chose to um, go to a six-month moratorium, and we did that on December 10th. So we have until, um, well, we set a time frame for ourselves for May 10th um, to be able to act on it. What the moratorium says is you have six months to make up your rules and regulations because there weren't any in regard to um, what we, you know, we've never dealt with this type of thing. So the state allows you to do a moratorium. And um, we've been 
filtering all sorts of different um, rules and regulations that other people have had, their ordinances and how they've done things. Um, and a lot of them came from Cattaraugus County because there a lot of people are starting to deal with this. Um, our code enforcement officer is here, and, and, and also we have the village code enforcement officer in the back. And we can tell you that more and more people are putting solar on their homes and on their land, and we didn't have rules and regulations in place to do that. So part of the moratorium will do that for us. So we have a, a meeting tomorrow night as a group to sit down and start formulating our plans and get everything in place so that um, we have the rules and regulations that we want. Uh, we will then it, hopefully have it done by the end of the month and then we will sit with Olive Wood Energy and see what they normally have as their rules and regulations and how everything correlates. Um, if it doesn't, obviously we'll go back to the drawing table. We can request another six month moratorium if we want. So um, that's with New York State, by the way. Okay. Um, do you have anything else you folks want to add? No? All right, so at this point, I'll open it to questions. And um, I'm the scribe here, so you're going to have to bear with me just a little bit. But if you would, if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand and tell me what your name is. And then I'll write your question, and we'll get an answer for you. Uh, my name is Fran Smith. Okay. I own the property on the uh, west side. This is the I want to want to say something, that a suggestion, mm -hmm. that if you have any more projects coming up, that you send written notice to everybody within 500 feet of a project is a courtesy. Mm -hmm. I, if I hadn't seen it in the paper, I would not have known. Um, I have um, just a couple questions, if I could ask them. Are you going to <coughs> clear cut? I'm sorry? Are you going to clear cut the property? No. Well, uh, it probably what we're going to end up doing is <coughs> is uh, well, they're clear cutting, and again, what that means is we you know we have to take out the uh, the secondary growth. Uh, the, uh, the land itself has not been used for roughly two decades or more, and so what we will do is we'll take out the secondary growth here, and uh, there is some maybe valuable timber up in up in this area here. And so we've given uh, Mr. Now the option. There he took it. Yes. To, uh, we already yeah. know, there you are, Dan. Okay, yeah. you logged it? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I, I know he's used a uh, lumber company down in Pennsylvania to uh, go up and, and do that. But in this area here, yes, it will be. <clears throat> so, and then here, but not the uh, rest. Of, so, okay, so I own, um, I own the west side. Um, that That's my line. So how close would you be coming What's your uh, plan? How close would you be coming? Okay, to the property line itself, this is what's going to be coming out of the ordinance that, uh, these, that uh, is being developed right now. Okay. But uh, norma so normally, from, uh, from what we have seen on, on a number of our projects, and we have a number of, number of them uh, across the country, <laughs> including uh, California, but the setback is, like, is roughly 200 feet. Now, in this case, I believe your property is on this side, She's on the left side of the Right line. here? Mm -hmm. Correct. That would probably be, that would probably be up here if we come up, well, probably it's better to look at this, but come up here from this section up here, uh, that's going to be a, uh, essentially 200 feet plus. Uh, from, and it's up towards state land. Yeah, yeah. And so we'd have to be 200 feet from the state lands. And then, okay, so then how about, how about the rest of the line? Then Is right in here? Yes. Yeah, no, that would be, we would not. Uh, You're not even going to touch it? No. Uh, and the reason is because of the slope, uh, okay. mm -hmm. uh, which I'm sure you've probably have been over into that area. And the slope is greater than 20%, which is not very advantageous for get, capturing all the, the, the photons from the sun uh, on an on a, uh, eight-hour, 12-hour basis. So the only, the only two questions that I have, because you've answered pretty much everything, is will you be altering the lay of the land at all? Will, you know, will you be bulldozing? Will there be any shelves put in? Or? No, uh, we will alter, there's no doubt about it, we will alter the lay of the land from the standpoint of the vegetation and the secondary growth is there. Mm -hmm. uh, from the standpoint of the actual, well, there will be some leveling, absolutely. But if, you, if one goes up, that, uh, up the hill, uh, are we talking 20 feet? No, we're probably talking a neighborhood of three to four feet leveling from the standpoint of being able to put the, if you take a look at the pictures I've given you of, uh, of the, uh, these actual solar sail and then one in the field 
uh, we would be uh, altering that from the standpoint of be able to placement of the solar panels. Okay. So, Lou, are you saying you have terraced? Is that what you're saying? They'll flatten out a terrace? And no, no, it will not be terraced. Huh. So you're just cleaning? Just cleaning out, yeah. I mean, a lot of that, we'll just use a brush hog. Okay, and then, so then the only other question <coughs> I would have is uh, how will you be um, controlling uh, growth? Um, Chemicals? That's a, that's, a, that's a good question. Chemicals? No. Goats? No. We just no. <laughs> we have, uh, uh, we're right now looking. Uh, in fact, uh, on one project in Ohio, there's a guy that uh, obviously is an entrepreneur, and he's got a, uh, a uh, tractor trailer load of sheep. And, they, and some of the solar projects have basically used sheep in order to unload them, put them inside the fence, and, uh, and do the uh, control. If you don't have sheep, then essentially we will utilize uh, uh, and we've had a number of farmers on our projects say, hey, you know, can I bid on the, uh, the mowing and of, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the land? Another alternative that we're looking at, and that is a pollinator. Uh, the bee uh, industry is undergoing some uh, difficulty, and so uh, there is a number of alternatives where essentially you have to plant native flowers, wildflowers within this fence end area. And as a result of planting the native wildflowers, then you invite a pollinator or bees to come in and essentially pollinate the, uh, the wildflowers and ultimately make honey. So that is something that, but we're, we'll definitely, there'll be, there'll be uh, sheep, pollinators, or uh, utilize a, a local farmer to do the, uh, to do the cutting. <coughs> Lonnie? Thank you. Um, I'm Lonnie Farrington, Code Enforcement for the town. I'm just wondering, you, you've got a view of coming down Baker Stand East. What's it going to look like coming up that way? Because I know that hill kind of slopes towards the, yeah. to the east also. And I also have property near the corner of Katie's Road and Baker Stand. And my side hill behind my property, which runs parallel with Baker Stand, I'm going to be able to look across that valley and see that, those panels, and I'm also concerned about glare. Yeah. Well, with glare, I don't believe, you will not see glare because of the absorption effect of the black, of the black panels. Now, where would, where, where, if I'm standing uh, right here, where would that be, Lori? Um, it's easier to see on this map, I think. Um, his property is it here. But because of the height, yeah. he'll He's be looking able to down. see across. Yes, right across. Okay. So right behind this area, okay. here he, you see he actually Mr. Baldo's owns this. Cabin yeah, he can see Baldo's cabin. You can see. Kitchen window. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, we were there today, and we were at you know, you we were been looking at you. <laughs> yeah, and we were saying, you know, I wonder, I wonder if that's if uh, if there's a, a building there. I take a lot of pictures out that window. Yeah, <laughs> and therefore uh, we were saying, you know, we we got to take a look at this and and contact uh, uh, Saratoga. Asso associates who does our simulation mm -hmm. just to see that so yeah. we'll probably end up doing that mm -hmm. yeah we did a worst case scenario from from a public standpoint but you know there, there's obviously private landowners like yourselves who would have questions mm -hmm. so yeah I know so we'll make a note of that and that's uh <coughs> Uh, and that's which room so right in right this area and it goes right up the hill right here and his property is here we own this this mm -hmm. this this and this okay mm -hmm. that's pretty because uh, yeah that that's exactly what we were looking yeah, at that is. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our house is right, right yeah. here Can yeah you do you come off that's do you I'm come going off going yeah okay. we're looking at a road yeah. do you come off here and it, and it cuts across there's a road here and then it's the vegetation covers it up right about here? Uh, there is a road that comes off of Baker Stand, but there's an access road, road. that comes up here and follows this. That's the one we looked at. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll have to take a look, right look at here. that. Let me mark yeah. this one. Just we were just to there today sure. looking and wonder. In fact, we couldn't <coughs> see how you could get there, but then if you come off that road uh, through, if you look at Google Earth, you can see that road. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll do it. My other question is, what determines <coughs> where the easement's going to be, if it's going to go across the conservation club or if it's going to go across down the road? 
what's going to determine is uh, cost. To put it underground on the utility right away is, uh, is pretty expensive. Uh, to to uh, put it here, we think it's probably going to be the better alternative, and so that's why we're negotiating with Mr. Baldo, uh, which is 1234 Main, and, uh, and the uh, conservation uh, group. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Good evening, just a second. Yeah. Doug, are you, was it Doug who uh, raised his Doug hand? Tanner, okay. 3618 Baker Sam Road, mm -hmm. Franklin Mill. Yes. Uh, from your picture here, it looks like you're doing monocrystalline photovoltaic uh, solar panels. That could be, yeah. Okay. It won't work in this area? I don't know. And the reason being, um, the closest city that we can use is Buffalo, New York. The annual number of cloud cover days is 311. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 85% of the time. Mm -hmm. That beats out Seattle, Pittsburgh, and Rochester, Cleveland, and uh, Portland, Oregon. <coughs> I have these numbers down for you uh, if you want them, Lori. Okay. Uh, polycrystalline uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, solar panels will not work. Neither will monocrystalline will not work. You would have to use the less expensive thin film solar voltaic panels. These are less expensive, but they work in overcast. And frequently here, we, I, I say, is, you know, we have another minimal sun damage skin day. We have overcast uh, 311, that's average, 311 out of 365 days per year. That's 85% of the time we are overcast. The monocrystalline, uh, the polycrystalline will not work. The thin film will work. The nice thing about that, it's less expensive than the other two. The uh, polycrystalline uh, is quite expensive and the most expensive is the monocrystalline. Uh, um, I built a greenhouse and I have three solar panels and a uh, cloud comes over and you hear all the fans their RPMs drop off to nothing. Uh, the, the waterfall pump stops. Um, they'll be in, you know, during the winter months, and we essentially call the sun the UFO, the unidentified <laughs> flying object. So those two types of panels, the more expensive panels, will not work here. Mm -hmm. The thin film will work, but you have to have twice as many panels to get the same thing. Now, uh, I don't know, Lonnie, you may be able to answer this. Is that property north-south? Yes, sir. Okay. If you have a static array, you won't get any energy until about 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, 9.45, 10 o'clock in the morning, and then by about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, 4 30, 5 o'clock in the end of afternoon, they won't gener generate electricity either unless you have dual access, and I know you're not going to do that, dual access tracking devices for each of the panels because uh, it isn't 180 degrees where the sun is. Franklin Mills at 44.33 degrees north latitude, it's like this. Mm -hmm. So you, you're, you know, east south, uh, east northeast, and mm -hmm. east uh, west northwest is where the sun rises and falls from June through August. You won't get power when the sun comes up because it'll be uh, if your solar panels are facing south, due south, they'll be way to heck over here. It'll be in shadow. Mm -hmm. The front facing of your solar panels. It, it, it won't work unless you have dual access pivoting. No, we're not going to have dual access. Tracking. You know, no, I know it's going to be a static array. Yeah. Um, but thin film, if you look it up, is the only thing that's going to work in Western New York because it's a mm -hmm. cloud cover. And I can tell you, uh, an anecdotally, I don't have data, but if it's cloud cover here in Franklinville and you go to Buffalo, sun's up. Mm -hmm. We're a high valley and we have more cloud cover days than anybody just about. Could, uh, could you possibly uh, 
uh, let me see the data and I pass it on to our uh, sure. engineer. I'd like to, yep. And I I'll get back with you in regard to their response. I don't think perovskites, and that's spelled E E R O B S K I T E S, okay. perovskites are going to come out in about um, five, ten years, but they have a humidity problem. They don't collect electricity if the panel has exposed any moisture. Uh, perovskites, uh, you can take a pane of glass, paint it, paint it with its liquid called perovskites, put two electrodes on it, and it generates electricity. Mm. And if that's your 30%, they're thinking 30% here in about five years. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> you need to go with thin film because the more expensive solar panels are not going to work in this area. Uh, and if you want to get this to Lori, could you, uh, could you, could you put your name down on that? Oh, and I'll get back to she, you. She knows me, I know. and she admits it occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> I will be glad to um, yeah, put yeah, information we'll, and get copies of that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate the I'll find research. Out, I'll find out what, you know, what, uh, what our folks will say, and I'll share it. I'll you, share that, that's, that's, the data is right there. Yeah. Okay. Do you know what the plan was to use? Uh, I, I have it in my briefcase in okay. regard to which it ones they are. It won't work. And, uh, but let me check it out. I don't okay. know. Okay. But I, I'll check it and out. The, and the nice thing is the thin film solar panels are less expensive. Okay. Okay. Well, I got all that, Doug. <laughs> Amazingly. <laughs> <laughs> Colette? <laughs> well, we pr I appreciate your, your uh, recognition and your suggestion. And uh, I will pass that on tomorrow. Okay. I, I was wondering if there's a financial advantage to all of this for the town mm -hmm. and how that works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish I had a definite answer for you. That was um, one of the things that this board has been discussing a lot with uh, this company because we feel very strongly that there should be a, a financial advantage to the town. Um, not only in what is being offered for uh, the site of the panels, but the fact that it ties in so easily to the substation area. Um, so we are under negotiations, under negotiations yeah. as to, it has been suggested that a pilot uh, payment in lieu of taxes be presented to the town. I will honestly tell you the town board is against that at this point. Um, we would like to see some other benefit to the town and um, I will, I guess I might as well say it right out sure. in public. Sure. <laughs> in talking with NYSERDA, they have told us that it is a possibility that we could um, ask for, and it would involve a lot of paperwork and things that have to happen, but um, our desire is to ask for a reduction in electric bills. And the reason being, <laughs> yay, she says, um, <laughs> the reason that we're saying that is, and keeping in mind, it wouldn't be significant. I'm not saying 50% off your bill or anything like that. But what I am saying is that a pilot, when you're given a pilot, let's say this is around figure $250,000 a year. You're given this pilot, and then um, over 20 years or 40 years, as Lou has mentioned, how much is $250,000 worth? Whereas I think we can probably all agree that we'll never see a reduction in our electric costs. Those, I think, will continue to climb just as other things do. So if we could agree on a percentage uh, for every resident in the town and village, um, and it would be a continuing thing per that property, so if you sold your property, it would go to the next person, um, then I think there'd be a better advantage to our townspeople. They did tell us we would be the first people in New York State to do this, and I have never <coughs> shied from being the first to do something. So um, <laughs> we have um, talked about it as a board, and I think we've all agreed that it would be the best advantage for our people. So we're going to try and work very diligently in that direction to get it that way. Now I'm trying to educate myself. Um, like on the Farmersville issue, and I read numbers and how that town is so split. And the rumors is that if they got them, it could really help them tax-wise. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if this went along the same route as that does. 
the pilot would, um, the payment in lieu of taxes. And you talk a lot of money for the windmills. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, I don't think we've actually set a dollar figure for a pilot program, um, but again, we'd prefer not to do that. And if we go through the process and we are able to secure funds so that there is some percentage, um, and of course there's, you know, there's a difference between the supply part of your electric bill and the delivery. 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 Thank you, Joe. <laughs> so it would be in one section of that, and I believe it would be delivery. Am I correct about that? It would be, if no, we'd we, be the supply. You'd be the supply. Yeah. I always get it wrong, so I apologize. Yeah. But we'd be looking at a reduction in the supply part of your energy bill. And again, I can't guarantee that, but we're going to do what we can do to try to provide that. Yes, Doug. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit off the subject, but on uh, July 23rd, 2012, mm -hmm. the earth almost got slammed with a chrome mass ejection. Mm -hmm. There was actually three of them. It missed hitting a direct impact on earth by nine days. We, we skirted it and it went right behind. It blew out one of our satellites, but that satellite was designed to study the sun in, in these coronal mass ejection events. Mm -hmm. There's a 12% chance, this came out in the last week, there's a 12% chance for each year over the next decade that we will be impacted by a CME. If, we, if that occurs and we're already hooked in, uh, they, they would probably know that it's going to hit Earth with, uh, within about a uh, 12 to 18 hour period. Is there any way that you can disconnect this from National Grid? Because everything will be fried. If you've heard of the Carrington event, it happened when there was just telegraph poles. It blew, uh, blew all the telegraph poles up and caused uh, fires on telegraph uh, offices. But the Carrington event um, was very similar. But there was actually four three or four CMEs that happen one right after another, but the chances of it happening is 12% per year over the next decade. So the question is, in the event of something disastrous like that happening, How do you disconnect? Can we because disconnect? Because that will be the only thing available for about 10 years. Nobody, will, we, will, we will go back to the 1800s. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you get? Uh, CME, uh, will you please, uh, we, uh, how do you spell that? Yeah. Coronal mass ejection. Okay. From the so sun. Solar flare. But it's a yeah. Solar flare. Well, it's not a solar flare. Solar flare is just this it's like firecracker. A magnetic yeah. That's pulse. a firecracker. Okay, it's not a solar flare. That's what I was going to ask you. Is that the same as a solar flare? A solar flare is a firecracker. CME is a solar mass ejection. But uh, July 23rd, 2012, we almost had a direct hit. And they're predicting. Uh, within the last week, I believe, over the next decade, <coughs> percent chance per year. Mm -hmm. it's, it's increases in the northern latitudes. In fact, Quebec actually was a 1989? Yes. Yep. I think most people would be easier to understand that, uh, call it an electromagnetic yeah. pulse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. the CME is, it's similar. is more similar. accurate. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's similar, but <coughs> on, on the white panel and back there, <laughs> I'm learning there's a... There's an example of, uh, of the interconnection with uh, <laughs> <laughs> that collapsed, you know. And uh, National Grid, which used to be, I, I worked in the utility, the National Mohawk, but National Grid, they have us jump